Ghost, right? But we're being prepared for it. We're thinking the right way, learning to think with God. Oh, encouragement. Wow. The Holy Spirit here today, tonight, right? Isn't that beautiful? Uh, let's take a moment and just give a blessing. Would you turn to your neighbor and just say, God bless you. You bless you. Good to see you. Wow. That's amazing. Hi, John. Pastor Tom is here from Virginia and Lygia. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Don Barnes and Lori from Indianapolis. Pastor Duke, or Pastor Duke is here back there, Caleb and Seth. Great to have you. And we'll, we'll have a uh, beautiful evening here tonight. Praise the Lord. Uh, is that Noah Frankenhauser? Is Noah here tonight? Okay, that is Noah, yeah. I might quote from you tonight, but it might be better for you to say it, but I might say it. I don't know. Can I say it in my way? Okay, maybe I'll get it right. All right, so we ready for a message for the Spirit to speak to our hearts? Great. <clears throat> wow. Lord, we thank you for your, you are our teacher. You, we have nothing but only, well, we have everything because you gave your son. And your son has enriched our lives. Your son has spoken. Your son dwells within us. And your glory is upon us. Lord, we are weak and frail, but learning, growing, believing, confessing. Anoint this evening as we say goodbye to that year and yes to you all the time. Yes to you, the big house, the house that God has built. Thank you in your name. Amen. Uh, before you're seated, turn to just a few places. Proverbs um, 14, verse 1. Would say it out loud with me. And my, our prayer is the Holy Spirit will package the message and really speak to our hearts tonight. Proverbs 14, verse 1. Ready? Every wise woman builds her house. Let's say it again. Every wise woman builds her house. How many women? Oh, wow. How many women are good homemakers? Huh? They are good at it, aren't they? Little, little things and the plants. Doilies. Is that a word we use today? I don't even know. Uh, little placemats and flowers and drapes and the fixings and trimmings and the details. Have you ever visited a men's dormitory? Okay, the health department closes them down. Okay, let's, Lord bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Chapter 9, we're going to turn a, turn a lot in the beginning and we're going to draw a diagram. The diagram you all know so well. Chapter 9, verse 1. Wisdom has builded her house. House building. Now go to Ecclesiastes, or Ephesians. Ephesians, chapter 2. How many have had a great Christmas? Christmas season. tell you what we'll speak about in a minute. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, 
that at that time you were without Christ. At that time you were without Christ. Do you remember the time you were without Christ? How many want to forget it? Okay. This is interesting. We are told to forget, aren't we? Paul even said it, forgetting the things that are behind, pressing towards. Our memory sometimes plagues us regarding our past. But we learned on Sunday that we have a scapegoat that has taken our sin and it never comes back. It's gone into the wilderness, never to return. So we should forget our sin and not remember it. But do you remember, look at verse 11, remember in time past, and then just skip to verse 12, you are without Christ. I want to speak about three things tonight. One is, remember, we were without Christ, what that was without Christ. <clears throat> Number two, um, going to heaven. I want to speak to you tonight about going to heaven. A little bit about that from my heart, what I think about that, that we are going to heaven, what that will be like going to heaven. What does the Bible tell us about this going to heaven? But before that, let's speak about how we were living without Christ, and we had no idea where we were going except to the ground. We were without him, and we did not know. And this is in Ecclesiastes, so uh, turn there with me to Ecclesiastes. How many of you have a secret lo love for the book of Ecclesiastes? How many have a public love for the <laughs> book of Ecclesiastes? I, I am fascinated with Ecclesiastes. I, I am drawn to it a lot. I think a lot about it, and, and I enjoy the, the honesty of evaluating life without Christ. Life without Christ. Do you remember it? I, I became a believer when I was 19 years old, and uh, I suppose somebody here became when you were five years old, so you don't remember your life without Christ. It's very possible. But some of you, like Wilson Lippy, I think he was 50 years old when he became a believer and has been so active uh, through these years. But do you remember how you lived and how you thought when Christ was not in your life? You had no Bible. You had no Holy Spirit. You had no real message except the one at the local bar room, bowling alley, university, chess club. Um, cabin, uh, beach, nature, woods. And I am sure that God was speaking to you through nature when you were without Christ. Psalm 19, verse 1, Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Many times when we were without Christ, we didn't want to know about the funeral we did not want to know about death. We didn't want to hear the bad news from the hospital. We were afraid if the phone rang, there would be bad news and devastating news when we had so little capacity for life as it really is. We've drawn this picture often. It's the house. It's going to be later tonight in one of the skits. That would be funny. It's supposed to be. This is the house that wisdom built. God built the house called the universe. Hebrews chapter 3. He has built all things. And he's put in us a searching heart. 
And we live here on the first floor of the house. We've talked a lot about it with other people. We're very social creatures. We'll talk about that also a little bit later. We live in the first floor of the house and we are searching in the first floor. We don't know it, but we're looking for the upstairs. We're looking for real answers. We don't have them on the first floor. So let's read a couple of verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. How many times have we heard uh, Beethoven's symphonies or the Swiss Alps, or we have looked at some beautiful child in the face, and we just are in love. I look at old Civil War pictures of these young men, and I look into their face, and I think of their youth, their vitality. Um, I think of their families, the age they lived in, and their short life. And I'm fascinated to think about life on the first floor. And I cannot figure it out. We cannot. But the wise man in this book is trying to find what life is about. Read verse uh, 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Let's write this word here frustration. That's the meaning of vexation of spirit. Unresolved living. Who has the resolution? Who has the message? Uh, Noah Frankenhauser, who's such a blessing, we talked with 20 men the other night and he said something interesting. He said, this fellowship tonight, we were there fellowshipping after service, he said, this is satisfying. But if we are with our unsaved friends or people, uh, guys just talking, we may talk about our problems, but it doesn't seem like we have real answers. We can talk and talk and talk, but not really find what is deeply satisfying. Is that right, Noah? Did you want to change that in any way? Say it? Okay, it's good. Thank you. Look at chapter 1, verse 15. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. This is on the first floor of the house. I hope you follow this with me. I'm not using a lot of words to explain what I mean. The first floor of the house in this world, time and space, human living without, without God coming through for us, made in his image, like asking the question. Here it says, um, that which is lacking cannot be numbered in verse 15. Then go to chapter 2, verse 15. Then chapter 2, verse 15. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. The same thing happens to the foolish man and happens to the wise man. The same thing. I cannot figure it out. There are some people that have a simple ideology in the first floor. Be good and good things will happen to you. But we realize that actually life is much more complicated than that. And there was a time when we lived without Christ. And we asked the same questions that this man is asking. Look at chapter 3. Verse 10, I've seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. I've seen their struggle. He has made everything beautiful in his time. 
Also, he has set the world in their heart. That word is actually eternity. He has set eternity in our hearts. And we're living on the first floor of the house with a yearning for eternity, a desire for satisfaction, a real answer to life. And he has made it this way because he doesn't want us to live without him. But we do. And so the man, the wise man here, is asking, the, articulating the questions that we have in our hearts. And as believers, I have these questions also. The same thing. Why is there so much pain? Why is there always something missing? Why have I failed? How, why am I so insufficient? Why am I so frustrated? Why am I yearning? Why am I hungry? What am I looking for anyway? It's the house that wisdom built. God built this house and made us this way. God made us this way to say why, where, where, who, why. One of my friends in Finland years ago was in a rock and roll band. They had a bus filled with equipment going in the countryside early one morning. The bus went off the corner, went around a curve too fast, rolled over in the field. And it was like a meat grinder. There were eight people in the bus rolling around with the equipment. And it broke his neck and a long scar down his neck and lying in the field. And it was silent. And he said the silence was, was deafening. And then one person groaned, why? Why? The first floor of the house, who can answer that question? There is no one. Even, even more, there is despair. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. Who knows the spirit of man? that goes upward, the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth. Wherefore, I perceive there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion in this life. How many of you have fathers, mothers, maybe family members, and they say the only thing to do in this world is to work and eat and sleep and have a good time? Eat, drink, and be merry. Because tomorrow we die, and nobody knows where we go when we die. Does that sound familiar? That's living life on the first floor. And that's how we all lived. And we went year by year in our lives without Christ. We didn't have answers. We were without Christ. And we didn't know. Where do people go when they die? Why, why am I yearning for more? Why am I not satisfied? Why is there always something lacking? Why is my eye never satisfied with seeing and my ears with hearing? Why? And the answer is beautiful. God made us for himself. Turn to chapter 12 with me and it even goes further in the first floor here chapter 12 verse 3 just bear with me we'll get moving in our message here and say what we want to say in a few minutes but bear with me chapter 12 verse 3 in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble this is a a uh, Description from verse 3 to verse 7 of the breakdown of the physical body. 
that the man is getting older and his fingers are trembling and the strong men shall uh, uh, bow themselves, the legs, the grinders cease, that's your teeth, because they are few. You are losing your teeth. And those that look out the windows are darkened. Those are your eyes. And the doors shall be shut in the streets. And the sound of the ground grinding is low. That's your hearing is going. And you will wake up at the voice of the bird. That's the light sleeping that the elderly people have. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. You can't hear the music like you used to. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, old people, elderly people, are afraid of high places. Fears shall be in the way. They will think, oh, I can't go outside. I, you know, I'm afraid I will fall or go up the steps or down the steps. The almond tree shall flourish. This is the white hair. Almonds are the white blossoms, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. I cannot carry that bag. But Grandma, the bag is like, it's so light. You carry it. I, the light burden is too much for me. Because man goes to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. The silver cord is loosed at your spinal column. Your backbone is loosened. The golden bowl, your cranium is broken you fall break your skull the golden bowl I love that golden bowl silver cord and the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it this is what we know, and we believe this in the first floor of the house. We know about the elderly, we know about deaths, we know about the diseases, and we know about, about how life goes. It is not a surprise to us. We study it and we think about it, and there it is written that a man or a woman, they get a little bit lighter, more frail, you know, Lose some of the hair, the eyes, the ears, the speech, the desire, and the fears. This is the point of Ecclesiastes. It lets us live in the first floor and look at life as it really is. That's a great treasure to us. We're not afraid of acknowledging the reality that God has designed for us. We're not afraid of acknowledging what life is. Actually, we are the ones that are able to look at reality in the face and say we have an answer. Amazing. Now let's talk. Oh, well, let's pause for more, not one more moment there. I was without Christ. The Bible says, remember you were without Christ. You were pagans. You were without Christ. Remember that. You were without Christ. Do you remember? Do you remember the talk? Do you remember how you met a believer maybe the first time and it just like was what? Or that's weird. Or why are they talking like that? Or they're talking about God like they really... Like, do you really believe in God? And what do you know about God? Do you remember we were without him? And have you met people in the course of your days and weeks and months and at work and, and in, the, in, the way, uh, in the activities of everyday life, the unbelievers, people without Christ? Wow. I do not know why we have him, but we have him. We are elected, I know. We were chosen, I know. But I don't know why. That's a mystery. 
I know that I made a decision, and I know God honored that, and I know I have free will, and it is my choice. At the same time, we are told that we don't understand this election of God, this work of grace, his decision, his sovereignty, and what he has done in saving us. Now let's turn to John 12, or John 14, please. And here it is. Verse 1. Jesus comes to the first floor as a human being, as God and as man. Jesus, thank you that you came right to our face and spoke to us. But Lord, why, why, why isn't everybody listening? Why isn't everybody aware? Why aren't you in everybody's face? And Christ, his answer is, actually I am. I've made every effort to be in everybody's face and to address their deepest need and to be their God. And I hung on a cross publicly to show them the love that I have for them. And I am in your, and if you will receive me, more is given. And unto him that has, more is given. Mark 4.25 and Luke 8.18. So the disciples have walked with him now for three years. They've said they had given up everything to follow him. And I think that's a very weighty truth in their lives. They found him. They became, they were drawn. There was no way to get upstairs in the house. There was actually no way to even know if there is another, st another floor in the house. There was actually nobody that really knows. Nobody has gone up to heaven but the Son of Man who has come down. He came to show us the way and the mind of God for man. That we would live in the whole house with him. And this is what he said to them. You will go to heaven. You will be going to heaven. That's what he said to them. You are going to go to heaven. And if it wasn't so, I would tell you. You will be with me in heaven forever. And we could kind of look at what? 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 It's like, come on, Jesus. I mean, we know about the fish and the mountains and the water and the stars and the sky. And Jesus is saying, you believe me. You have been made for the glory of God. And my Father is glorified through you. My great grace, my blood shed, I send the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. And you're going to go to a place that my Father has. Look at chapter one, 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Lord, I'm filled with trouble. Just read Ecclesiastes. You know, you know like it's so shallow. I'm so filled with the vexation of life. Have you ever gone gone to work like that? You know, like, we we got you're living like that now, right? You go, the, you're doing the you know, yeah, the mill story with the donkey and Samson. Remember, Samson's eyes were taken out, and the Philistines. What did they do? They hooked him up to the donkey harness. And he was pushing the millstone round and round as a blind man. And that's what I think the, the devil wants for people is to stay here in the first floor and get hooked up to a harness and you can't get out of it and to be blind and just go round and round and round your whole life your whole life. 
of saying, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. It is over. You know, Vadim told me, he's one of our Russian immigrants here, and I've been in St. Petersburg, Russia often, and been to the Lenin Mausoleum back when it was Leningrad. People get married, they'd come to the mausoleum, put flowers there. And sometimes when people died, they would go to the Lenin Mausoleum. And at that mausoleum, there would be, there would be wailing, tears uh, shed, wailing, crying, inconsolable crying, and tears. Because somebody died, and the message of Lenin is, it's over. Atheism, materialism, you know. And there is no comfort on the first floor of the house. There is no message on the first floor of the house. Do you remember when you were without Christ? Do you remember? Do you remember that? When you were without Christ, and there was no real message that resonated in you, there wasn't really any solution. But when Jesus comes, he goes right to it. Look at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, and in our in our in our diagram here, I mean in my father's house. I don't know, we, we have not yet seen, but, but there is a kingdom, and it, it is God, God's kingdom. And in the house are many rooms, many mansions in the King James. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And this is what we believe. I believe, as we read in the book of Revelation, there is the lamb on the throne. And he's not the big, powerful, muscular kind of NFL linebacker type of guy. He is more than that, of course, in his power. But in his nature, he's a lamb. He blends in, he's humble, and he's weak. And it's like us at Christmas time, I think, in with your family. If you had a beautifully warm family time together, maybe you did. Um, maybe here in our assembly, a warm a family feeling of sense of t connection and love and care. Heaven is like that. It says, uh, John Bunyan said in his book, Pilgrim's Progress, I saw in my dream two men, Christian and hopeful, went in at the gate. As they entered, they were transfigured. They had raiment put on that shone like gold. There were also that met them with harps, crowns, gave them to them the harps to praise crowns and token of honor. Then I heard in my dream all the bells in the city rang again for joy. And it was said unto them, Enter you into the joy of your Lord. I also heard the men themselves sing with a loud voice, saying, Blessing, honor, glory, and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And just as the gates were opened to let the men in, I looked in, and the city was shining like the sun, the streets paved with gold. In them walked many men with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands, golden harps. There were also them that had wings and answered one with another, Holy, holy is the Lord. And after that they shut the gates, and I wished I myself was in there among them. You know, with some imagination, we read Hebrews 12, we've come unto the city of the living God and an innumerable company of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. 
and the, the uh, blood of the lamb that speaks better things than that of Abel. And I, believe, I know we're going to know each other, recognize each other. We know that because God isn't dumb. And he wouldn't make us so dumb that we would go to heaven and not know who was who in this perfect world of intimate fellowship and communion without any sin nature with an incredible amount of joy and connection. Matthew 8, verse 11 uh, is where I just, you know, I meditate and think about this this way. Now we'll read it to you. It says, And I say unto you, many will come from the east and west. But Jesus is saying this because a centurion needed Jesus to heal his servant. And, and um, the centurion said, just say the word. I just say the word and your, my servant will be. Don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. And Jesus marveled. And then he said, I say to you, many will come from the east and the west. And what does he mean? Outside of the borders of Israel. This is a Roman. But he will come. And the Chinese come. And through the ages, the centuries of the martyrs that will be in the city and will have this amazing sense with each other of this humility because it will be washed, will be drenched in this humility and this resolution, the resolution of life that we're all looking for that we can't find on the first floor. This answer, this meaty, real gripping solution. Oh, I see. I, I do not doubt it, but God's ways are perfect. Oh, I understand. Man is a liar, but God is true. Oh, this greatly glorifies God in hiding his ways from men and leading them in humility and in brokenness and in intimate connection with his own person. He says here, I say to you, and he's speaking to the Jews, to the disciples, many shall come from the east and west and shall, shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm taking that literally. I don't read it any other way. Heaven is sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It must be a table. We sit down, and there we are. And Jesus is there. And the spirit of Jesus. And the healing for all. It says there will be no more tears, no more pain. Uh, we re In Revelation chapter 21, we realize, or chapter 22, verse 4, uh, we realize that man has been not made to die. He has been made to live. And this means going to heaven. Perfect place. With a, with a relationship that addresses everything. Everything. It's the relationship that addresses my deepest longing. It's the face, the face of God. Lift up thou thy face upon us. The psalmist said, Psalm 27, God said to the psalmist, Seek my face. He said, Thy face I will seek. Psalm 4, he said, Lift up thou. Many say, Who will show us any good? And then he says, Lift up thou thy face upon us. In number 620, uh, 623, this was the blessing of the priesthood. The, and the priests would say this blessing upon the people, that God would put his face upon us. I, I believe it's about the face in a spiritual way. A face answers the face. 
That's why a Christmas gathering with our family where there is love, there is peace, there is a real care where that is so satisfying to us. But we, we could freeze it, freeze the frame for a moment, and we say in the first floor, we wish we could, this would, could be, we wish we could have this moment forever. Freeze the frame, and that's what I want forever. But it's gone. And then there's the turbulence and the things that happen and the thing that's lacking and the lack of satisfaction. And God is saying, did, did you smell heaven? Did you taste it? Did you see? Uh, did you get a feeling of it? Was I with you? Did you recognize the answer when I gave it to you? Did you hear the word when I spoke to you? Did it go into your spirit? And did you know that it was God that was speaking to you? Isaiah 30 verse 20. My teachers, when you give me the bread of adversity, my, our teachers will not be swept into the corner, but they will stand before us and we'll see them with our eyes and a voice will come behind us saying, this is the way, walk therein. That's the third part of the message. Here it is. The third part and that I mentioned but didn't write down. It's, if we were without Christ, if we are going to heaven, then what about now, 2013-2014? What are we learning? What are we knowing? You know, it doesn't seem like long ago we were worried about the computers crashing in 1999. Remember that? And going into the year 2000, remember? Uh, it didn't seem too long ago for some of us, but now we're 14 years past that. Have things changed? What is happening? I do not know where things will go. Let me just show you a little math here for just to stimulate you. When I was in Bible school, we, our, one of our teachers said, 1948, the Jews went back to Israel. I mean, they went back in the turn, the turn of the into the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, in the 1800, the, the Zionist movement started, and the Jews started to go back in droves back to Israel. 1948, surprisingly, it became a nation, Israel, legally bona fide a nation. And our Bible school teacher said, Jesus said, when you see the fig tree blossom, you know that the end is near. And our teacher said this would be 40 years as a generation. So we were, we said, maybe 19, if you would do the math, 1988, subtract 7 from that uh, Jesus could come back sometime in 19. You know, he, but he didn't give dates because we don't do that. We don't give dates. But it stimulated us and said, yeah, we're in the end times. Christ is coming back. Let me use the same thing now. 1948. And use the number 70 years. 2018. When is Jesus coming back? I don't know. He didn't come back in 1981. Didn't come back in 1988. And who was that man that passed away? He was doing the billboards. <laughs> the guy in the radio, right? And uh, am I doing that? No, I don't know. But I am curious. I am thinking. I am stirred up. I am happy I am here. Because, listen, here's the last thing in our number three point here. Where, where is it? Here, this, this thing. Here's, what's going on right now? This is what I... If I'm going to go to another place, wouldn't it be good for me to know about it? If I'm going to move to uh, India, wouldn't it be good for me to know what India is like? Let's put it here, India. Right? If I'm going to move to Brazil, wouldn't it be good for me to know about Brazil? And if I'm going to go to heaven, heaven, wouldn't it be good for me to know, to feel it, smell it, hear it, think about it, to have a last supper, and for Jesus to speak to me, and to say to me the deep things, 
to show me the whole house now while we are here. And in Ecclesiastes, he speaks about the body breaking down. The grinders cease because they are few. What a great memory Bible verse that is. And the singing girls and the music, I can't hear it very well. Anymore. And I'm afraid of heights. God forbid that I carry the grocery bag. It's too heavy. All that is very real. But there's something else very real. Psalm 92, verse 10. We bear fruit in our old age. How about this one? That which is crooked is made straight. This is Isaiah 40. John the Baptist said it. The prophet Isaiah said it, quoting what John the Baptist will say. A voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the path and make that which is crooked straight. Because Christ took death, and he took it, and he gave us life. Christ took our sin, and he washed it away with his blood. Because Christ took us who had no inheritance and put our name in the Lamb's book of life. And Christ put his Holy Spirit in us, like Noah Frankenhauser said in that beautifully, beautiful way. He put his Holy Spirit in us. And now there is like sleeping, sleeping peacefully. Or uh, the, now there is a sense of an amen or hallelujah. Isn't that the meaning of the word? Hallelujah is, is just a word, a Hebrew word for an extraordinary praise. Hallelujah, you in the world in the first floor cannot get it. You do not have it. You cannot figure it out. You cannot find it, though a wise man seeks to find it out. Ecclesiastes 3, 18 and 8, 17. Though a wise man seeks to know it, he cannot find it. It must be God gives it to you. Therefore, fear him. This is the whole duty of man. To fear him and keep his commandments. And we are not doing it by law, but by his great grace, by our new birth, by the engrafted word. We are doing what he has told us to do. And now our life takes on a reson resonating sense of eternal meaning. And yeah, we die like everybody else, but no. We have already passed from death into life. John 5.24 yeah, we have trouble. We, we know life like everybody else says, but I am in the local assembly and I'm learning about this heaven in the local assembly. This is the closest I can get to heaven that we're going to. And I think when we go, it'll be like, I know the place. I know the fragrance. This, the spirit, I, I know, I, I, this is my home. This is the home. And you know what a home is? A home is a place where you can be who you are, be loved and accepted, not because of what you have, but because of who you are. You are my son, this is your home. You are my daughter, this is your home. You are my wife, this is your home. And you, you, this is, uh, heaven is our home. And God is our Father. And life makes sense. And wisdom has built the house. Foolish pluck it down. They make a mock of sin. The fool, it says in Proverbs, the fool makes the, he makes a mockery of sin. It's a joke to him. He thinks it's light. Doesn't matter, doesn't care about it. But no, in this house, sin is not a game. And we said that before too. I like this illustration. Um, a guy throws firebrands and arrows and firebrands. He shoots them at you, firebrands and arrows. And, and then, then he says, oh, I'm just joking around. It's a sport. I'm just playing around. And you look at him and saying, it's not a joke. I'm not playing around. I cannot be with you. 
I cannot be with you. It'd be like two men with high-powered rifles going deer hunting in Pennsylvania. They're out in the Fort Woods, and then a shot rings out, and the bullet buzzes by your ear, and you turn around, it's your buddy, and he said, ah, oh, just playing around, it's, everything's good. And you, what do you say? Not going to happen. I'm out of here. You stay here. I'm driving 100 miles away from you. I'll never be with you hunting again. I cannot trust you. The same thing, people have a light attitude regarding life. They don't realize their value. They don't realize what truth is. They don't realize who the Holy Spirit is. They don't realize what the Bible is. They have forgotten they were without Christ. And now they have Him. And I would rather have Him a thousand times more than anything that is in this world. Give me every, anything and everything. I would rather, I want the whole house, the whole enchilada. I want the whole thing. Because that's why you have been made. And the tragedy of the human race is that people take the serious things too lightly and they take the light things too seriously. The tragedy of life is they throw away the valuable stuff. The baby goes out with the bathwater. Their theology doesn't make any sense. Their, their commix, con, uh, commitment in life is too shallow. They have nothing really to live for. But boy, friend, let me say, that if Jesus looks at you in the face and he says to you, I go and I prepare a place for you, and if it wasn't so, I would tell you. I'm telling you, this is not a joke. This is my, this is me, God. This is my blood. This is my purpose. This is for my glory. And I have made you to take it, bite into it, and get, and it would be, you just get it. And you got it. It's like God's gotcha. And you just say, you got me, God. You got me. I'd never be the same. I, you've touched me. You've anointed me. You indwell me. You speak to me. You direct me. You love me. Thank you, Lord. And that is what I feel is happening in our assembly. Over and over again, I hear the, the beautiful, quiet little words of real meaning in the hallways and the footsteps and on the phone and emails where people in India write and they just say, These, you know, this is amazing and different parts of the world and, and we feel it and sense it. And I think it's because the Lord's given us a little bit of something to read about and just say, do you know you're going to go there? You know you're going to go there? Do you think I made you to, your body to rot and to wail? And to be wailing with no hope and no message. And to be crying your eyes out. And ripping out your heart. And saying, I'm alone. I have nothing. I am, I have no, my, it's over. And they say suicide, the rate of suicide is increased in the history of recorded history. Higher than ever before per capita in the history of the human race. And we have to say, I remember. I remember the stupidity, the lightness. I remember that life. I remember without Christ. I remember nobody ever talked to me about God. I remember. I remember it. And now I know this. And I wanted to I want it to be in, in my heart. And I want to be part of you and the whole and what the Lord wants for us this year. And it is for them. And <laughs> why not? It is for them, isn't it? It's for them who have no hope, no message. And the amount of craziness that's going on, is it, is it, is it increasing? I, 
I don't know, but it's heart-wrenching, crushing, devastating. I read the story up on 924, Route 24, rather, up in Hartford County. Some man, a thief, he broke in. He broke the glass in the building. And when he went in, the, the detectives understood that he, he, he ripped open an artery in his arm. So he's going through the office and there's blood like spurting, I mean, obviously by the evidence. And then he, he left, but he, they found him, his body down by the road. He bled to death. When I hear those kind of things, and I, I, how do we know? How do we know what, what could change a life? How do we know what church service where somebody would come? How do we know what our prayers will do for somebody lost? How do we know what will happen if we have a telephone hotline? We used to have in Hungary, we get 600 phone calls a month. And we put it even in the telephone book, our emergency phone number and we put it in schools, and then we did a teenage pregnancy uh, in public schools, bus stops, and I, we have, I think, 18 little girl, little babies, boys and girls, 18 that were born because of our efforts from teenage girls that came and talked, and we gave them an apartment to live in and have the baby if their family rejected them. There are so many things we can do. And there is so much that can happen because we have Christ. We were without him and wondering what's going on. Now we got him and now we're right there. Right? And we were without Christ. Oh, does the spirit go up? Does it go down? Are we any different than a dog or a gorilla? I mean, what's the meaning of life anyway? Let's go have a party. Let's get drunk. Let's do something different, whatever it might be. But oh, wow. Jesus came to us and he said, I have a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would tell you. Now, now here we are. We're feeling it. We know it. And we have a mission. We're thankful for it. To be together, God is glorified in it. And, and, and we, we, we're too dumb. I, believe me, I'm too dumb. I'm, I, I don't know what's going on. I have no, you and I, we, I don't have any, there's nothing here. But there is the second floor of the house that has made everything different for us. And he is glorified by that. He did it. He saved you. He forgave you. He's with you. He answers your prayer. He cares about you. He leads you. He gives you the hunger. He cries. He, he knows. He's with you. And you say, Lord, I, I want more. He said, thank you very much. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. You will have it. I am that kind of a God. In the world, you're always a buck short and the day late, and you always get a parking ticket, and they always catch you speeding, and your car is always broken down. In the first floor of the house, the things that are lacking are without number, and you'll never be satisfied. But come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn of me in the local assembly. Have your own Bible. Let me, let's just say this too. This is a long message, but it's New Year's. We've got midnight anyway. Listen. Hey, why don't you say this year, I'm going to read through the Bible, maybe, by God's grace. This year, I'm going to get the Bible. It's going to get in me. This year, I'm going to learn to be a soul winner. Like a lot of other people are soul winners. I'm going to learn about that. This year, I'm going to be part of a... I'm, this year, I'm going to get prepared for meeting Christ in heaven. And maybe it happens this year. Maybe it happens a decade from now or a couple of decades. We hope so. But uh, if so, we're 
getting prepared because this is written in a book because this is 